Hi, welcome to day 40. Today's episode is brought to you by a capital A, which of course stands for Ampere. Uh, thanks for handing in your tests yesterday. Today what we're going to do, we're going to get a start on the new unit and it of course is your last unit on electric circuits. And today, as you can see, just a, a little introduction to DC circuits. Uh, posted along with this video, there is a PDF that looks like this and we're just going to go over this PDF and we're going to explain it and fill in a few blanks. Now, you'll notice that we're talking about DC circuits in this unit. DC, of course, stands for direct current, where the current flows in one direction only. Uh, batteries, for example, supply DC current. Uh, AC stands for alternating current, and of course, in alternating current, the current flow, it alternates directions. It flips, flops back and forth, first one direction, than the other. Uh, Manitoba Hydro, they supply us with AC at 60 hertz. In other words, what's coming out of one of the wall outlets in your house is current that is doing this. It's going one way, and then the other, and then the other, and then the other, and so on and so forth. It does 60 flip-flops, boom, boom, boom. It does 60 flip-flops like that every second. Let's take a look at a typical circuit and we have one pictured here and your typical circuit it has a source which could be pardon me which could be a battery a thermal couple a generator a solar cell you get the picture but any source is going to have a positively charged positive terminal where the where there's a big concentration of positive charge and of course, a negatively charged negative terminal where there's a big concentration of negative charge. And you'll notice what we have here is a charge imbalance. What we have here is a potential difference. And you can imagine what happens. If you're an electron right here, these negatives are gonna push you around the circuit. These positives are going to pull you around the circuit. That potential difference, it supplies an EMF or electromotive force that sends the electrons around the circuit. And of course, in this particular circuit, the electrons would be flowing this way. If you were going to show the current direction in the circuit, remember, it's kind of weird. Current is actually the way positive charges would flow if they could. So the electrons are flowing this way around the circuit. But the current, if we're going to show the current in this circuit, it would be going in the opposite direction. If charges, or pardon me, if positive charges could flow, they would go like that. Uh, okay, uh, of course, the next big part of any circuit is the conductor, what connects it all. Usually some type of metal wire. And here's a close look at what makes a conductor a conductor. Now, uh, metals are really good conductors because inside a metal, the atoms are arranged in a really regular pattern. So if you're an electron and you're zooming along, if you miss the first couple atoms, well, you're gonna miss all the rest of the atoms and you're gonna have a free ride. It's gonna be really easy for you to go right through. Uh, insulators are just the opposite inside an insulator and most non-metal materials are insulators. Inside an insulator, the atoms, they are kind of all jumbled around, hodgepodge, uh, anywhere at all. And if you're an electron, zooming along, you might miss the first couple atoms, but pretty soon you're going to run smack dab into another one and you're not going to get very far very easily. It's a real struggle for electrons to get through an insulator, of course. Uh, all right, uh, also in any circuit, there's the load. That's the reason the circuit exists, right? It might be uh, a light bulb, a speaker, an electric motor, a stove element. Basically, it takes the electrical energy of the 
electrons and converts it into some other type of energy. A light bulb, for example, converts electrical energy to heat and light. A speaker converts electrical energy to sound energy. An electric motor, uh, like the one that starts your car when you put the key ignition, pardon me, when you put the key in the ignition, that converts electrical energy to kinetic energy. A stove element converts electrical energy to heat energy. You get the picture. And of course, uh, some circuits, not all, but some circuits, maybe even most, they have a switch that you can use to uh, make or break the circuit, to close or open up the circuit. Okay. This particular switch is closed, allowing the electrons to flow around. I think on your handout on the PDF, the switch is open, and of course that would mean that no electrons would be flowing. What you're looking at right here is of course a closed circuit, a continuous loop of conductor that the electrons can flow around. And when you hook up a circuit like this to the source, the instant you connect the conductor to the source, the electric field or the electric force that these negatives exert on the electrons as they push them around the circuit and these positives exert on the electrons as they pull them around the circuit, that electric field or that electric force, it's transmitted around the circuit at the speed of light. So as soon as you hook a circuit like this up, boom, those electrons, they are moving pretty much instantaneously. Now, the thing is, the electrons, even though they start moving instantaneously in the electric field, it propagates around the circuit at the speed of light, so all the electrons feel those forces of attraction or repulsion, the actual speed or velocity of the electrons is actually very small. This is something a lot of people don't realize about electric circuits. Electrons in electric circuit, they typically move at the rate of about a hundredth of a centimeter per second. They barely crawl along. Some physicists refer to that as the drift velocity of electrons in an electric circuit. Because let's face it, uh, they're just kind of drifting, they're just kind of crawling along uh, at a hundredth of a centimeter a second. It's not like they're zooming around. Now, you might ask, remember, an ampere is a coulomb per second. In other words, if you're looking at a coulomb of one ampere, you're seeing 6.24 times 10 to the 18th elementary charges pass you by every second. And remember, a current of one ampere isn't that big a current. You might ask, well, how can you possibly have a current of one ampere? How can you possibly have that many electrons passing you by every second? Okay, if the electrons are going so, so slowly. And of course, the answer is because the electrons are super close together. Remember, they're smaller than individual atoms. So the fact that the electrons are packed very, very tightly together well, that means, yeah, current of one amp is possible. You can have that many electrons passing by every second, even though the electrons are moving very, very slowly. Now let's take a look at an open circuit where electrons aren't going to be flowing around. And here we have a classic open circuit. There's a big gap here, a big open spot. And when I taught grade nine science, I used to tell my students, well, electrons, they're not motorcycle daredevils. They don't do gaps, they don't jump gaps, and left it at that. But we're gonna delve into this in a little more detail. What's really going on when you connect a circuit like this up with a big gap up to a source? Well, remember, the electric field, the electric force, it propagates around the whole circuit instantaneously, just like that. So just like that, these electrons start moving in this direction. These electrons, they start moving in this direction. And what's gonna happen right here? Well, the electrons, uh, in some respects, yeah, they are not motorcycle daredevils. They do not jump gaps. You're gonna get a bunch of electrons, a bunch of negative charges building up here. And what's gonna happen here? Well, you've got a bunch of electrons leaving this zone and no electrons coming in to replace them. So over here, you're gonna have a bunch of lonely protons. 
So you get some charge buildup on either side of the gap. What do these negatives do? Okay. Well, they repel all these incoming electrons and they stop them moving like that. What do these positives do? Well, they want to attract all these electrons back and they stop them from moving just like that. And of course, these charge buildups, they happen almost instantaneously. So yeah, the electrons, they stop moving pretty much instantaneously. There is no flow. Now, occasionally, if you have a huge potential difference over here, if you have a very powerful voltage source, like we're talking, I don't know, if this gap was a centimeter big, if you had like a battery with a 50,000 volt potential difference across its terminals, okay, you would get such a big buildup of negatives here. There would be so many negatives piled into this space and there would be so many positives piled into this space uh, that eventually you would get a spark discharge. These negatives, there's going to be enough to actually push a couple uh, across this gap and these positives, there's going to be enough to actually push a couple of electrons across this gap and you're going to get a spark discharge. But again, that takes a very big potential difference. Again, for uh, a one centimeter gap, you're going to need uh, a source of 50,000 volts to produce a spark discharge over there.